Have you ever thought about what's inside an integrated circuit? The sort of small black um, rectangles that sit inside every single piece of electronic equipment. Well, today I'm going to talk about a couple of things and give you a quick overview of a few components that almost always are inside. And then I want to talk about something called electrostatic discharge. All our integrated circuits exist in the real world, and that means that we have constraints placed upon the integrated circuits from how the world works. Where does it get the energy from? Where does it get time from? And so on. And since we walk around in a world that is filled with electrons, and then we have a tendency to pick them up. And then we, when we touch electronics, they have a tendency to jump over. So if I have, do I have a board here? I think here I have a development kit uh, from Nordic Semiconductor. And that little chip there, that is a Bluetooth radio with a microcontroller and so on. When I touch here, touch the board, then any excess electrons or lack of electrons I have in my hand will jump over. That's why we usually touch things by the sides. And that can actually be quite a few electrons. If you see a spark gap, it can be a kilovolt. And that kilovolt can turn into a current. So I want to talk about that. But how can you really figure out what's inside an integrated circuit? A good place to start is if you know <laughs> what the circuit is. Take an example. Um, here is a paper that is written by, well, I don't remember the name. Let's see here. Let me see if I go there. I should be able to show you this. Right, <clears throat> so Sen, Sen Yan, yeah. they have made a circuit and inside that circuit is a temperature sensor. And now a temperature sensor is what I ask you as the students to make this semester. And this is the temperature sensor. You probably don't know how it works as of today, <laughs> but don't worry, I will try and explain how these temperature sensors work. What I want to think about right now is what can we see? What, what sort of um, functions must the chip contain in order for this temperature sensor to work? So, okay, we have a ground. <laughs> so there needs to be a ground pin on, the, on the, this chip. There's a VDD. There is a current somehow. There is some output signals. There's a reset signal. There's a digital block, which means there must be a clock. And if you read the paper and you try to sort of list up what are the different things that this integrated circuit must contain, well, this is the list I got. Maybe you find something else. So we have a two supply voltages, one for the analog supply and one for the digital supply. And this is quite common for any chip that you have a lower supply for the digital. So that supply has to come from somewhere. It can come externally from a battery, but quite often batteries has quite wide range of voltage, like a double A battery may be from one volt up to 1.9 maybe. So quite often there will be, for example, if we have a lithium ion battery, that's a 3.6, 3.8 volts normally, maybe up to 4.3, there will be what we call a regulator, something to change the voltage into something stable. That can be a switch mode regulator or it can be a low dropout regulator or a voltage regulator. And that will give us a stable 
for example, a 3 volt or a 1.2 volt for our chip. Now, any voltage is really a difference in charge density between two places. And we've sort of invented this magic concept of ground, which is actually referred to earth ground, kind of outside. Uh, on a mouse that you carry in your hand or the thing on my wrist here, uh, ground is whatever ground is locally. The battery ensures that there's a difference between the ground and the supply. So it's sort of this magical place that it's not that important, but all voltages are always a differential between two points. There is no such thing as a voltage in a node. If we say that, then we mean that it is referred to this magical potential called ground. Since the temperature sensor has a digital logic circuit, it must also have a clock. Pretty much all the digital logic in the world run off a clock to clock the flip-flops. And in, if you choose to uh, look at the Caravelle, which is the sort of um, harness for making chips within the eFabless and on the Sky Skywater, that has a 40 megahertz clock. So the clock could be 20 megahertz or it doesn't really, well, it does matter for the time um, the temperature sensor takes to convert to uh, digital. But we need a clock. And we need a reset, something to make sure that the digital actually stays in a known or starts in a known condition. They have a bias current, that must come from somewhere. We have to generate that. That could come from externally on the chip, but it's a bit wasteful to waste a pin on a chip for a bias current. It's possible to make them internally, and we'll talk about that. There we use, it's actually called a bias circuit or a band gap reference, and then a voltage to current conversion. For clocks, in order to generate clocks, you can actually get the clock externally or you can also generate them internally. And here we need an RC oscillator or maybe a, well, if we need the clock to be accurate, maybe we have an external crystal, then we have a crystal oscillator something to drive the crystal. Now crystal is a resonance device that gives you a very accurate frequency, plus minus 50 ppm maybe, even or even more accurate than that. But those crystals have a fixed frequency, let's say 32 megahertz. Now in order to generate a different frequency, we either have to divide the clock, that's quite easy. If you have a clock, you can always use a counter to divide it. But if you have to multiply a clock, for example, to go from 32 megahertz to 2.4 gigahertz, how do we do that? Well, we can use something called a phase lock loop or a frequency lock loop or a delay lock loop to multiply. Actually, delay lock loop maybe are not that often used for multiplication, but PLLs or phase lock loops are an extremely common block in order to multiply a clock. And we'll learn about that in the course. Then we have a number of digital outputs. So there's two phases. I guess uh, maybe you didn't notice that. Oh, let's see if I do that. So there's two phases, phi one, phi two, and somehow that is used to do something. There's also something called chopping. That is a, maybe you've heard about that already, but that's a concept to reduce the offset of um, a circuit. That, that's the same with dynamic element matching. It's an offset reduction technique or mismatch reduction technique. So any digital or any circuit, integrated circuit, will have a number of these sort of infrastructure blocks, regulators, PLLs, and so on. And if you now look at the course plan that I laid out for this course, it's sort of reference of bias, filters and DAX, switch capacitor, which more a circuit technique, oversampling converters, voltage regulation, PLL oscillators, and then a bit uh, bigger example at the end. I'm trying to teach you the block that you will almost always in, uh, find inside an integrated circuit. Integrated circuit. And for, for example, voltage reg regulation will go through 
uh, normal voltage regulators and we'll go through switch mode regulators so yeah oh yes one more thing if I have an integrated circuit and I haven't connected it to anything like this board how how do I how do I ensure that all the digital circuits inside the little chip here actually start correctly when I turn on the power so right now if I've left it off power long enough, then the voltage will be the same all across this board. And it'll be, well, let's call it zero. Compared to the ground on this board, it is zero. But when I turn on the power, somehow the VDD will go from a low voltage to a high voltage. Now what it does then, I don't want the digital to start up immediately. Because if the digital starts up immediately while the voltage is too low, then the digital doesn't work and it can get locked in an uh, unfortunate state. So I need a circuit on my chip that ensures that whatever happens during the ramp up of the VDD, I do not start the digital or I do not change the state until the VDD is high enough. There's a couple of ways to do that. What you're looking at right now is an idea I had uh, many years ago on how I could use the tunneling in a thin oxide uh, transistor to generate a, this is called a power on reset. So one of the challenges in the power on reset is that if you want to exactly trigger at a certain VDD level, let's say 1.6 volts, then inside my power, power on reset, I need a reference, something that tells me what 1.6 volt is. And I need a comparator, and I may need other circuits, which actually is not that easy to do. And it does require current. Another strategy is just put in a filter. So whenever the VDD goes from a low value to a high value, you put in a low pass filter, Kinda. Is it a low pass filter? Yeah. To ensure that it takes some time, so I have a signal that is low, it takes some time from when the VDD goes up until the um, output from the uh, low pass filter turns on. But that time has to be long enough for the VDD to rise high, uh, high enough <laughs> not to uh, start the digital too early which means you need a long delay. And now the idea you're looking at here is um, what you see on the left side is just a um, diode string divider. So you have a number of PMOS, a number of NMOS. The voltage at uh, the point here going into the gate of this PMOS is just given by a couple of VGSs of whatever the current through this uh, diode string is, it's going to be proportional to the threshold voltage of these PMOS and it's going to probably be less because this pretty this is quite low current, but the voltage at 4 here is going to be lower than VDD. So VDD shoots up, the voltage here stays a bit lower, which means that this PMOS 4 here is a source follower and that keeps roughly a constant voltage across this thin oxide gate. Now, this was intended for a 65 nanometer technology. So in that technology, there was quite a lot of gate leakage, sort of nanoamps. And this structure then turns into effectively a uh, resistor. And that resistor will charge a thick oxide device. This is just a transistor used as a capacitor. So the node called X here will, when VDD turns on, it w the node X will stay low. And then at some point, uh, it will rise high enough such that the
Schmidt trigger and 5 here actually flips. The transistor and 8 is just to pull it low again when the VDD goes low. Um, it's not that important. So we need this type of circuit also inside an integrated circuit to ensure that whenever the power turns on, we keep the circuit in a known state. These circuits are called power on reset circuits. And I find that they are probably one of the more scary circuits to make because if you're responsible for the power on reset circuit, it's a quite a simple circuit, so it's not, it's not very advanced, but if you make a mistake or if there's something that you haven't thought about, then nothing on that chip is going to work because it is sort of the master of now everything is okay type of thing. So if it says um, <laughs> everything's not okay, then nothing works. So power on reset circuits, simple but very scary to make. Electrostatic discharge. As I said, every time you touch something, then the potential between your finger and whatever you're touching will equalize. So if you have an excess of electrons, then you'll lose some. And if you have a deficit of electrons, you pick something up. That implies a movement of electrons, which implies a current. And for any in an integrated circuit, you actually have to be very careful about uh, electrostatic discharge because the current will induce a voltage. So if I push a current into a pin, then that's going to create a voltage and our transistors are very sensitive to voltage differentials because they have quite thin, thin oxides. There's a couple of different methods or ways of describing the phenomena that can happen in real world when it comes to electrostatic discharge. There's one that we call human body model and there's a second one that we call charge device model. These both apply before we put the chip on a PCB. After you put it on the PCB, then you still have human body model because I can touch <laughs> my PCB. So when I do this now, then uh, I'm sapping every single circuit on this chip, on this PCB. Um, but there's slight differences here because uh, on PCB level, you have to think about something called system level ESD, which is a slightly different standard to um, human body model and the charge device model. But what does this mean? So it's basically two methods of describing a model of how an ESD, ESD event looks like. So this is me uh, modeled by a 100 picofarad capacitor and an assumption that it's uh, 1.5 kilo ohm from that capacitor to my finger. Now I could be charged to a very high voltage Maybe it's four kilovolts. That's just an excess and an excess of electrons. That means when I touch something, that's sort of similar to discharging that capacitor through that resistor. Now, at a four kilovolt difference or a four kilovolt on that capacitor, that will turn into about two point six, uh, sixty-seven amps. And four kilovolt may be sort of a typical uh, spec for an IC. Uh, one to four kilovolt is usually the range maybe even higher for uh, specific device, specific chips that are connected to USB and things like that. The human body model ESD event is like a current source pushing, pushing a current into our chip. And there's quite a longer duration, about 100 nanoseconds. And our chip has to handle it somehow. Charge device model is different. So if we think about a integrated circuit in an electric field, so take a circuit, flip it on its back, put it on an FR4 uh, or an oxide or uh, insulator, um, and then underneath have a metal plate that you charge to a kilovolt. Now, given that the field lines are quite close to the surface here, and we're gonna assume that they're orthogonal to the surface, there will be initially a field inside the chip. However, over time, if we make the assumption that there's an equal number of electrons and equal number of holes inside the chip, then if we look at the chip uh, outside when we don't, don't put it in this electric field, then the electric field through the surface should actually be zero. That's what is said by Gauss's law. So given that we have zero charge inside, 
there's an equal number of electrons and protons, then the electric field through the surface must be zero. That won't happen initially, but over time, the charges inside the, the um, device, the chip, will distribute such that um, there will be positive charges close to the surface uh, of the chip, or this is a yeah, top side, and there will be neg negative charges in uh, towards to the bottom. So that means that there's an equal and opposite field kind of inside the um, chip, at least in the metals, that sort of cancel the electric field outside. It's not really an equal and opposite electric field that cancels anything. It's just more than um, if there is an electric field inside a conductor, there will be a current. And over time, that current will lead to potentials um, equalizing, since this chip is not connected to anything yet. But as soon as we take one pin and we ground it, then again all the potentials must equalize. Now suddenly we uh, will have a zero volt uh, all across the metals on the chip. But what happens? So imagine we have a circuit like you've shown here. We have uh, two digital circuits, one's powered by VDD1 and the other is powered by VDD2. They are separate pins on the package. And let's say we have sending a signal from the VDD1 domain to the VDD2 domain. In this case, before we sort of close the switch to ground uh, in the previous page, then the potential will sort of be equalized everywhere. Uh, it's about a kilovolt. As soon as we close the switch, then very quickly the VDD1 will be zero volt. There's a conductor here. The current through that will ensure that the potential on the pad is roughly zero. Of course, there will be a voltage drop, there's inductances, blah, 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 but you get the drift. <laughs> At uh, t equals sort of right after we close the switch, the VDD1 will be well, starts its journey towards zero volt, but the all the older voltages, they are not at, they are maybe not started the journey. If there's no physical connection between VDD1 and VDD2, and maybe there's very small capacitance between them also, then VDD2 may stay high while VDD1 continues towards zero. And that creates a problem, because then across the PMOS here, for example, in the gate, if we assume that the output here is, well, l roughly halfway between zero and, and one kilovolt, or it's close to zero volts, then across the gate oxide, you may see kilovolts. <laughs> and that's definitely gonna break it. So silicon oxide has a breakdown strength at, uh, it's about five megavolts per meter. So given that our, the thickness of our um, oxides are usually sort of a few nanometer, I think that should turn into a breakdown of about a volt or something. Yeah, yeah, let's say two nanometers, that's breakdown of about a volt. Five megavolts per centimeter? Uh, it might actually be five megavolts per centimeter. Yeah, you can Google. Anyway, the transistor breaks. And we, as circuit designers, we have to ensure this doesn't happen. Because we're responsible for the chip um, and uh, we can actually sell it. And you can't sell it if it doesn't pass, a C pass ESD. Now what we can do in this case could, for example, be to place diodes between VDD1 and VDD2 because the grounds, they're actually connected for the between these two circuits. Now let's take an example of a human body model ESD SAP. In this case, I have slowly charged a 100 picofarad capacitor to about a kilovolt or more. And then I discharge the capacitor through this 1.5K uh, resistor. Now, Nothing prevents me from pushing that current into ground. So VSS, it might be a bit small on this image, but nothing prevents me from putting putting it into VSS and connecting VDD to ground. 
nothing says that you have to put in the ESD sap the right right way around for a circuit. That means that you can't really rely on VDD being a high potential and VSS being a low potential. It might have flipped around. So whatever circuits you put in to protect your protect towards these ESD vents, they have to work if up is down and if down is up. So given that we can push it in on any single pin or any single VDD or any single VD VSS, we end up with a number of permutations. Now in this figure, I've tried to draw the VDD, the VSS, and this can be any of the pins. And somehow we have to put in circuits that can handle these sort of really high currents or a few amps. So let's start with, with some of the simple permutations. We can, if we push it in on VSS and it leaves t via VDD, and VDD is grounded, then we can simply put in a diode. This doesn't change the behavior under normal operation because in that in normal operation the VDD is high, the VSS low is low, so this diode is reverse biased. And we can do a similar thing for the pin. That's fine. Now, what happens if we push the current in on VDD? So VDD under normal operation is already at some sort of voltage, let's say three volt. But if the voltage, and in this case, when it's three volt, we definitely don't want a short to ground. We don't want to be able to short a big current to ground. Because if we do short a big current to ground, then we drain our battery within seconds, or maybe nanoseconds, microseconds maybe. This is kind of what happened to, uh, I think it was the Samsung Galaxy, way back when. I don't know if it was the ESD uh, devices that triggered, or if it was a slightly different phenomena that we'll get back to. But I'm pretty sure, uh, my first guess would be that it was related to that, where the Samsung Galaxy phones actually caught fire because they heated up so much, because they drained the battery too quickly. Maybe it was a mechanical thing, but one possible um, root cause could be that the ESD protection triggered. So for ESD designers, what we're actually talking about is that we need some way of, under normal operation, when it's sort of three volts and maybe a bit higher because we have to tolerate some spikes, then the ESD circuit does not trigger. But as soon as the voltage exceeds some point, then we want to be able to short a big current from VDD to ground very quickly. Now, there is one circuit that can actually work sometimes uh, in some technologies. And that is what I've shown here. This is an NMOS and it's a grounded gate NMOS. Now, with everything you've learned so far about transistors, the connection that you see here shouldn't work. Do you agree? The gate source voltage is zero. If the gate source, vol gate source voltage of an NMOS is zero, there shouldn't be any current. Yeah? Okay. But it works. I know it works. I've used to it, used it. It's really good. Well, sometimes. And it can carry huge current, much larger current than I would expect from spy simulation of a NMOS transistor that is on. So how does it work? And here we have to go back to the solid state physics. Now, what you see now is a cross section of the transistor. It's the same transistor as we had in the previous picture. We have connected the gate and the source and the bulk to ground. Now, the drain we have connected to a high potential. So as long as this is three volts, then nothing happens. At a certain point, maybe it's eight volts, then something interesting starts to happen. So in the P substrate, you know that the majority carriers are holes given by the dopant concentration, the acceptor concentration. The minority concentration, so the concentration of electrons is given by Ni squared divided by the um, dopant, the uh, acceptor concentration. So there are electrons in 
in the bulk. They're continuously generated and continuously recombined, but th there is an intrinsic number of electrons there. In the depletion region, so that sort of region between the n plus and the p minus, there is a lack of uh, electric charge, which means that there can be a field because there's not necessarily a current flowing in here. Now, if we have a high potential, so a plus potential on the um, drain, and well, the p is its grounds, there will be a high electric field f going from n to ground. Now that high electric field, if you get an electron, a stray electron, a minority electron, that comes sort of close enough to that electric field, then it actually sees, an, uh, <laughs> call it an electric field in the right direction for the electron. It will sort of disappear. It will accelerate due to the force on that electron and it, it will go up to the drain. This is the leakage current that you have in diodes. but there's an interesting thing that, that can happen if the field strength is high enough because as the electron accelerates, it can actually reach a high enough energy such that when it scatters off the silicon lattice in the depletion region, it has it can have enough energy to knock out an covalent bond. Take a covalent bond and sort of knock it out. That generates an electron hole pair. So then from one electron, you get two. Now that new electron that you generate, that you free from a covalent bond, that can also accelerate and reach impact ionization energies, and you free another electron. And that original electron, that can just done the same again. So you go from 2 to 4 to 8 to, and you get what's called an avalanche condition. A condition where the current suddenly increases almost without bounds. So there's a sudden huge surge of electrons going from the substrate or the bulk underneath the transistor or the drain region here up towards the VDD. And since the voltage at the um, VDD or the drain here is high, then there's an abundance of holes. So whatever electrons I can push up, then I, the uh, holes will sort of go in the op opposite direction and they any hole that I free in the depletion region will see an opposite field, right? Or, or see the same field but travel in opposite direction, so they will end up in the bulk. Now, this avalanche condition, that doesn't really necessarily damage anything. All that happens is that you get a bunch of holes suddenly. You increase the hole concentration at uh, underneath the, um, in the bulk underneath the transistor. Now, if you give those holes time, then eventually they will diffuse and drift over to uh, the um, ground. But what can happen here is that if that bulk contact is a distance away, then what you're actually doing is you're increasing the local concentration of holes. And you're changing the voltage across the PN diode that is given by the bulk and the source. Now, if that hole concentration is high enough, the voltage here is high enough, so that you actually turn on this uh, diode. So what happens then is that you get electron in injection from a source, a place where you have a lot of electrons, into the bulk. Not the channel necessarily, but inside the bulk here. Now, immediately, th those electrons, although they're now in a P-type uh, uh, material, they don't really recombine with holes sort of immediately. It takes a while, and they have a certain diffusion length, a certain length they can survive, and that length is quite often longer than the channel length of this transistor. And if that happens, you sort of increase the electron concentration here, and that will accelerate the avalanche. And now, I really have a direct electron current from source into the p-substrate directly to drain. And that current can be huge. It actually can grow without bounds. So what we have to do quite often is to uh, slow that current down. 
we do that by, for example, removing what's called the silicide on the drain side region, which is sort of a metal that you put on top of the drain to reduce the uh, drain resistance. And we can remove that, and that sort of slows the current down a bit. It puts a resistance into the system, such that, uh, because if you don't do that, then actually the current can grow so high and the temperatures can become so high up that the silicon melts or the silicon side melts and you get sort of pretty pictures. These uh, pretty pictures will look something like this. So what you see on the left side is, a, is the um, protection circuit. Uh, and here you can see the NMOS. The NMOS uh, has the source in the middle here and then has a drain here, and w what has been done here is extend the drain to give a bit more resistance and probably also remove the silicide on top of the drain. But if you don't do the layout of these right, then the current, well, the, the heating will be too extreme, or the currents will be too high, and you will see this sort of current filamentation where you can see the path of electrons. They sort of accelerate from the source and they blow up close to the drain and everything melts. So, yeah. It's kind of cool. Um, it's a quite fun because uh, where I work normally, we have a SEM and we have a FIB and we have the ability to do make these images, and it's it's really a good way to ensure that you have understood a failure well is to see pictures of it, especially when we do transmission electron microscopy and we can actually see the channel and how it's melted and so on. So that's a cool phenomenon, which means that if you do the layout right, then this ground and gate animals is a good way to protect or uh, create something that can short the current from VDD to ground when this VDD is too high. Because normally this avalanche condition doesn't happen, so you, this uh, transistor doesn't turn on. There is a second phenomenon that can cause damage, and that sometimes happens when you have an inverter, a digital circuit, close to the edge of the chip. So <coughs> the conditions that you actually get is, let's say I pull 100 milliamps out from a pin. I can do that because uh, through the ESD protection that we just put in, uh, if ground is connected here, I can pull a current out, and that means that the pin will be at a low voltage. Now, you can do this by simply connecting it to uh, a lower voltage, and there will be a current flowing. But the interesting thing is that sometimes, when you do this, then in a digital circuit that is very far away, maybe 100 micrometers or something, you can get a short from VDD to ground. So a current that you only pull through a pin can somehow change the current somewhere else. And the interesting thing is that if, I, if, if this current only is for a short while, this uh, current or the current that I pull out from the pin is only done for a short while, 100 milliamps for, a, let's say, a microsecond, and then it's gone. The short from VDD to ground in this inverter, that can still be there. And that can stay there forever until the battery drains. So how can this happen? And again, you won't be able to see it in your spy simulator. It is only when you look at the um, circuits in TCAD or transistor CAD simulation, or you think about it using your knowledge about solid state physics, you will understand how it works. So what I've done here is to redraw the circuit. And the first thing that will happen is that, so uh, first of all, maybe let's, uh, if you're not familiar with cross sections of transistors and, and uh, PMOS and NMOS, let's just go through it. The substrate is uh, P minus, the N well that we put in with the implant ionization or, or impact, what's it, shooting in, uh, ions into it, uh, is N minus. And the plus and the minus, that just means that the doping concentration, the amount of phosphorus atoms that we put in is higher in the drain region here, or actually in the bulk, in the, uh, the well connection region, than it is in the well. 
And in that N well, we have placed a PMOS transistor. So that has P plus on the drain and uh, on the, uh, actually this is the source and this is the drain. And the gate is connected to the input. And for the NMOS, we have the gate here, we have the oxide, we have the N plus for the source and for the drain. And both around the um, drains and sources, there will be a depletion region. So here we have a built-in potential that is negative on the P side and positive on the N side, which sort of prevents current in, well, it prevents current in one direction. And then we have the P uh, plus contact. Okay, so what I said earlier was if we have a pin, imagine this N plus, where we pull a current, <coughs> then what happens is that we actually inject electrons into the P minus, sur sur mm, P minus substrate. Those will be in minority carriers, so eventually the electrons may recombine with holes, and you don't see, um, see them anymore. But they can drift around for a quite a distance. And if they get close to a N well, since here I have a built-in potential that is negative on the P side and positive on the N side, they will be accelerated by the field and will be swept over to the N well. Now in the N well, <coughs> there's going to be a certain resistance from deep in the N well up to this uh, bulk contact. And what can happen is that those electrons actually pull down the potential in the N well sufficiently to forward bias the P and junction that you see here. That's sort of the second thing that happens. At that point, I will get electrons, oh sorry, holes injected from the uh, supply into the end well. And the holes are a minority carrier. They may not recombine instantaneously. And if they get close to the depletion region through the P sub, P substrate, they will see a field in the forward direction. So again, uh, the field is positive on the N side and negative on the P side. And they're swept across by that field. And now we're into the same condition as we had before, where we increase the hole concentration underneath the transistor, and we may forward bias the source bulk diode. If that happens, we get electron injection. And again, electrons are now a minority carry in the P-sub. If they get close to the end well, they will drift over. And now, we're back to the beginning. We're back to the beginning where we have uh, electrons injected into the end well, pulling the potential down, and we actually have a positive feedback loop. This is called latch up. It is a phenomenon that is dreaded in any integrated circuit because <coughs> it could actually happen as a consequence of an ESD event. For a short while, uh, there's a huge current that is pulled out of the chip, and afterwards, there's a short between VDD and ground it's a very bad thing because things can burn. <laughs> Your battery can drain and so on. <coughs> but it actually, this type of um, circuit, it's called a thyristor, and <coughs> it can actually be used constructively also. So when it comes to ESD, you have to handle it. It just has to be done, but you don't have to do it alone. You will probably get some support from the Foundry, from TSMC, from Global Foundries, from Skywater. Or if you just want to pay for the problem to go away, you can get help from people like Sofix. And if you go to their website, <coughs> I think we can actually, let's see, Sofix, about us, let's see, applications, uh, silicon rectifier. Here you can actually see the thyristor that I just described, and it's actively used. So this is sort of, um, it's not drawing the inverter, but it's actually the, um, it's a similar structure where they actively use this phenomena of kind of latch up, um, and then design ESD structures based on that. Okay, that's what I wanted to cover today. Have a fantastic day.